はい、えっと、それではあの。It's time to begin. This is the working group on voluntary efforts and continuous improvement of nuclear、uh, safety under the Nuclear Energy Subcommittee Advisory Committee for Natural Resources and Energy. This is the ninth meeting of the working group. Thank you very much for your attendance despite your busy schedules. It's going to be a long meeting. We plan to go on until 8 p.m. We apologize for this、uh, late ending of the meeting. Uh, we have uh, uh, light snacks、uh, in front of you. So during the meeting,、uh, feel free to uh, uh, bite on some of the uh, uh, food that's been provided as we proceed. First, let us、uh, confirm the materials and the participants from the Secretariat, please. So we have the list of handouts、uh, and agenda,、uh, and a list of members, and、uh, several materials. Uh, if you are missing any, please let us know. Material、uh, one is broken up into one, two, three. So one, 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 two, one, three. And there's also material two. And Inoue, Furuta, Yagi members are、uh, absent today. And、uh, we have two guests, two guest speakers. like to introduce them briefly.、Uh, first, from EPRI,、uh, we have、uh, the vice president. Uh, Mr. Neil Wilmshurst, and we have the、uh, international director,、uh, Mr. Yang.、Yes. Ms. Yang, excuse me. And、uh, material three, two is、uh, Mr. Wilmshurst's、uh, biography. And briefly,、uh, he was with the uh, uh, UK uh, Navy and got his. Uh, uh, Degree there, and、uh, he was uh, uh, and he got his uh, degree uh, in nuclear uh, uh, engineering. and、uh, He worked at TMI 1 and、uh, he did、uh, engineering and plant、uh, support in the US. and、uh, Before joining the civil uh, nuclear uh, field、uh, for 13 years,、uh, he uh, was uh, on a, a nuclear submarine in the uh, Royal uh, Navy. Uh, as a naval nuclear plant operator. So at uh, uh, APRI, uh, he is the uh, chief uh, officer for nuclear、uh, and he is、uh, the vice president of APRI. And from IMPO, we have、uh, Dr. Spinato or Mr. Spinato,、uh, international director. And the material 5 2 is his biography that has also been、uh, distributed to you. And Mr. Spinato. As shown on the second page,、uh, worked uh, uh, as an engineering uh, supervisor uh, at the US Navy. And then he worked at TMI 2 and other nuclear plants. He worked as、uh, an engineer. And、uh, from 1988,、uh, he has been、uh, participating in IMPO. And So、after joining IMPO, he was uh, uh, seconded、uh, to Wano. So he has served dual roles and、uh, concerning、uh, nuclear plant operations. He has、uh, been deeply involved in the enhancement of、uh, safety. So, Mr. Wilmhurst, uh, uh, Ms. Yang, uh, Mr. Spinat, Sp- Spinato, thank you very much for coming long distances to join us. And、uh, we have simultaneous interpretation receivers today. Channel one is Japanese, channel two is English. And uh, uh, please make sure you leave the simultaneous interpretation receivers when you leave the room. Thank you. In terms of today's agenda,、uh, we're、uh, going to talk about systems necessary to improve uh, uh, safety uh, and LWR safety study.、Uh, this is the second installment. and so What we'll be doing today is、um, is the mic on? Is the sound coming? To,、uh, it's, it's going to the interpreters,、uh, apparently.、Uh, so I think you will hear me.、Uh, now it's, the volume is up. So, the 
outline of today's program. Well, in the previous meeting, uh, Mr. Sekimura uh, talked about uh, research on LWR to enhance safety. There was a comprehensive uh, presentation. So this is uh, meant to deepen that discussion. So from the Secretariat, uh, we're going to hear about the current situation of uh, LWRs in Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to hear about the cooperative uh, nuclear safety research between authorities and other organizations, the U.S. case, that will also be shared by the Secretariat. Then we will hear from the two guest speakers, and also um, uh, Mr. Uetsuka, a member of this working group. First, we will hear from uh, uh, Mr. Wilmshurst. He's going to talk about EPRI activities so that we can learn about the uh, U.S. situation. And then Mr. Uetsuka uh, will talk about the JAEA, uh, LWR safety uh, research. That will be followed by QA and discussions. And uh, we hope uh, to end that part uh, by uh, 1900 or 7 p.m. Yeah. And so in the second half of this session, well, in the past uh, working group uh, discussions, we have uh, talked about uh, IMPO on many occasions. Uh, so this is the uh, industry voluntary efforts to enhance safety. And so we have a guest speaker, Mr. Spinato, to talk about uh, uh, IMPO activities. And then we'll have discussions following his presentation. And we plan to end at uh, 20 hundred hours. And uh, so first, uh, concerning uh, the LWR safety uh, research, uh, I asked the Secretariat to, to give a short presentation. So LWR safety uh, research, in order to uh, deepen your discussions, we're going to hear about the U.S. situation from Mr. Wilmshurst, and we're going to hear about the JAEA safety research from Mr. Uetsuka. And uh, as a uh, prelude, I uh, talk about the materials 1, 1, 2, 3, and material 2. I'd like to briefly explain these materials. Uh, first, 1-1, one, one, and that's uh, METI's uh, work on LWR safety research. And so what is the uh, research program that the METI uh, sponsors? Uh, broadly speaking, uh, th page 3 is the overview, page 4 is uh, uh, the uh, most recent 20 fiscal 2013 uh, projects. R&D programs. So we have uh, subsidies to enhance safety, and uh, we have uh, the uh, program to uh, strengthen the technological uh, foundation, technological uh, base. So we have uh, budget for that. And then uh, page uh, six, if you would jump there, uh, we have uh, the METI-wide uh, uh, program. Uh, to uh, promote uh, industry-government uh, collaboration. And uh, we have 5.5 uh, billion uh, yen budget for the LWR safety research. Of course, uh, after the uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear accident, LWR uh, research and uh, decommissioning uh, research is now uh, garnering more uh, attention and the budget. So the total amount is about 20 billion uh, yen. And uh, next page. At the METI, what uh, uh, R&D budget uh, we have, and uh, this is not JAEA, but uh, university-based uh, uh, research program. So uh, subsidies provided to university researchers directly. So uh, there is uh, the research initiatives on basic nuclear foundation strategy, uh, and uh, uh, there is also the uh, uh, projects of R&D on nuclear systems. And then the very last page, page four, uh, we have uh, support for university uh, researchers. So direct grants to researchers, uh, three billion, a little less than three billion uh, is the budget uh, allotted for that. Next page, please, page 11. This is uh, uh, R&D at uh, JAEA, and the page uh, 12 is uh, the uh, total uh, budget amount, and page uh, 13 is uh, the research uh, fees and uh, or budget uh, uh, over time. And so we have the FBR research uh, funds. 
uh, from 2012, it has been reduced significantly, the FBR funding. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, the electric power industry's uh, work on safety research. That's uh, material 1, 2. And in this material, the electric utilities' uh, uh, common uh, issues are worked on. Uh, and uh, so there is uh, the uh, uh, joint research amongst the electric utilities. And this talks about the uh, safety research uh, done in that context. And the uh, specifics are on page 6 onwards. On page 9, uh, there uh, is the uh, research uh, topics and uh, re then uh, a research funding trend. Well, after the Fukushima Daiichi accident, the, there has been this uh, shift uh, in this uh, trend. Uh, concerning nuclear fuel uh, cycle uh, from t uh, fiscal 2010 to 2011, uh, that has been uh, now transferred to uh, individual companies. So that is one uh, reason for this decline. Uh, so in terms of the contents of the actual joint research programs, that's on page 10 onwards. Uh, and then there's material 1-3. Uh, uh, Mr. Kirimoto uh, supported this work. So this uh, is the uh, research done at uh, uh, CREAPI, Central Research Institute of the Electric Power Industry. And uh, the past the history uh, overview is on page 4 uh, in a chart. Page 5 looks at the uh, uh, budget figures uh, over time. Concerning CREAPI, well, based on the initiatives uh, of each of the uh, researchers, uh, a lot of uh, research has been pursued. And uh, this looks at, uh, uh, well, the, the actual amount uh, that is allocated uh, to LWR safety research is uh, difficult to uh, ascertain, but from page 7 onwards, uh, we show the actual examples of uh, research projects. And uh, lastly, if you look at the material 2, concerning uh, uh, reactor safety research, uh, the promoters and the regulators uh, can share the outcome. There is that uh, fundamental foundational part. Uh, and also after uh, the uh, uh, Fukushima accident, uh, uh, NISA has uh, been uh, remade uh, into the NRA, Nuclear Regulation Authority. And uh, uh, in, the, uh, so in the U.S., uh, we look at how they are working uh, on uh, to, or mit to mitigate conflict of interest. And uh, on pages 3 and 4, it talks about uh, NRC's uh, R&D. Uh, the considerations uh, taken for inter uh, conflict of interest. And then uh, in terms of uh, R&D with DOE uh, or research laboratories under DOE, it's stated that even if there is conflict of interest, if uh, there is uh, justification for conducting joint research, it can be done. So sharing of scientific uh, foundations uh, is being pursued in the U.S. So that's ex explained there, and that's all from the Secretariat. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope there's no questions for that. And I'd like to move on. I'd like to call upon Mr. Wilmshurst for his presentation. About 40 minutes, please. Please. Does that work? Can you hear me? OK. So first of all, I want to thank the working group, ladies and gentlemen, for, uh, for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a great honor to um, explain EPRI to you. I look forward to this. I look forward to your questions. First slide, please. What we're going to go through today is just an introduction to EPRI. Then we'll go through some nuclear specifics. And then some examples of our work on improving nuclear safety. Um, and then talk about relationships around the US industry. And then just a quick summary. Next slide, please. OK, EPRI was founded in 1972, about 40 years ago, after a blackout in New York City. Most important thing here is the second bullet. We are independent. 
and that is core to our value to the industry is we do not, even though we're funded by the utilities, our core principle is we actually are independent of any influence from those utilities, and that is the value. We, when we do work, it is scientifically pure. Collaboration. We work with members around the world, we collaborate, we bring information together, and we share it outside. I'll give more examples of that later. We have major offices in California, in North Carolina, and in Tennessee. Next slide, please. I mentioned the event that caused EPRI to be created was a blackout in the late 60s, which caused EPRI to be created by the US industry in 1972 in order to maximize the amount of research that could be done. Next, please. So this is important, talking about collaboration. When I was introduced, it was for me to explain how it works in the US. You'll see from this slide, EPRI is much more than a US organization. I refer to us um, as a global operation based in the US. We have all the US nuclear utilities and members representing the 100 plants in the US. We also have participation and members from over 20 countries around the world. And when we look across the world, about 75% and increasing of the nuclear plants in the world participate in the EPRI programs. So what that means is most technologies are covered and consider the power of that collaboration, people from 20 or more countries coming together, sharing their needs, and sharing their good practices and their research results. That is really the secret of EPRI, bringing all those people together from around the globe to talk about research. Next slide, please. We talk about our participation in two groupings. One you have here talking about full members. These are the members who participate in everything we do in the nuclear sector. So here you have all the US utilities, different countries around the world, and four utilities in Japan, Chubu, Chugoku, Shikoku, and TEPCO all util nuclear utilities in Japan participate in our programs at some level. It is just the four highlighted here participate in everything we do. Next slide, please. So I often get asked, so what is it that EPRI does? I'm aware there is some perception that all we do is coordinate research that all I am is a conductor, conducting the orchestra, and we don't, we don't actually make anything ourselves. And I've really got to tell you that is, not, that is not true. We do a considerable amount of research in-house, and yes, we do a significant amount outside of EPRI as well. The reason for that is the principle of EPRI is to do the research in the best place in the world to do that research, not just because we have a laboratory and we're going to do it there. We will identify an issue working with our members and we will then find the best laboratory, be it in Japan, be it in China, be it in Russia, wherever, and that work will be done or it may be done in our own labs. My staff, we hire the best technical expertise we can find. They sometimes do the research. Other times, they coordinate the research from many different research entities and bring it together. So it's a process of adding value by bringing that collaboration together. And this, show, this chart shows, in many ways, how it works. The national laboratories, universities, research institutes around the world, they do basic science. There's very many uh, entities doing basic science. The challenge for many of those entities is how to get that basic science 
into a mode which is usable by electric utilities. EPRI's role is to fill that gap, connect the basic research back to the utilities, make it usable. I call it, we connect problems with solutions. The solutions are here, we identify the problems working with the utilities, and we connect the two together. Next slide, please. So this just shows you how it works. We have results coming from the global um, research entities. We send dollars to those research entities. We have a network around the globe of people we do research with. We also do work internally, as I mentioned. We work with our members. They tell us what their problems are. They tell us what their needs are. And additionally, my staff, their role is to look out into the future and see what's coming five, ten years in the future and advise the members what we should be doing. And I have a slide in a moment. We are guided by a group called the Nuclear Power Council. Last week, we had a meeting in California, in San Francisco, of the Nuclear Power Council. That week, we had 600 senior people from around the world came to a hotel, and we spent a whole week talking about collaborative research, a very, very powerful network. Next slide, please. So talking about our internal expertise, we have about 200 technical staff based in North Carolina and in California predominantly. About half of them have either PhDs or master's degrees. A significant number have worked either for vendors or as utility personnel. And that is an important aspect of our work because we have a significant number of our staff understand what it's like to work on a nuclear power plant, what it's like to work in a vendor. That is how we can connect the technical solutions to the utilities and make them transferable because our team understand what's needed. The people down here, these are my five directors. My director of materials, PR, um, risk and safety and engineering. He's, uh, Ken Canavan, he's an internationally known expert on risk and safety. Christine King, looking after chemistry, low-level waste radiation management. Steve Swilly, NDE. And Tina Taylor, who's looking after new plants and our long-term operation efforts. Very strong team, which I'm very proud of. Next slide, please. This is a, a chart. I won't stand, um, spend very long on it. This is our Nuclear Power Council the senior executives who met on Thursday last week. The real point of this chart is to show you the, the seniority of these people. There are some names here you'll recognize. For example, Masuda-san from Chubu Electric, Anagawa-san from TEPCO. But also throughout this, we have Maria Korsnik, who's a CEO. We have maybe most of the US CNOs participate in this body as well. So we bring together this global collection of senior executives to advise us on research. And I don't know of any organization that can pull this group together to talk about research and development. Next slide, please. So moving on now to some examples of what we have done to improve plant safety and reliability. Next slide. This is a chart from NEI and I know NEI were here last week, and this shows the capacity factor improvement of the US industry from 1971 up until 2012, 2011, 2012. And what you see is the capacity factor moved from the, the low to mid 40% up to now year on year 90% capacity factor. And this took a concerted effort across the industry to make that happen. And EPRI doesn't claim to have been the only reason that happened. IMPO had a role in it. The utilities had a big role in it. But EPRI contributed significant information and research to get there. 
And here are some examples. Online maintenance, moving scope out of the outages into online. EPRI had a key role in developing this, using PRA techniques, using risk inform techniques, demonstrating to the US regulator it is safer to do the work online than it is to wait to repair equipment in the outage. Reliability-centered maintenance, significant amount of work done on reliability-centered maintenance. Working on fuel failure, EPRI has been leading a charge in the US to, and we've almost got to the point now where the US fleet has no failed fuel. Tremendous achievement. Material aging, a lot of work done. About a third of the money we spend is on material studies. And I refer to this as understanding what's going on with the materials so you can plan when to act, what to inspect. So you're managing the plant rather than responding to issues on the plant. And you see examples all the way through there. Next slide, please. And so what happened, capacity factor went up. At the same time, it can be demonstrated that safety increased as well. By the focus on all those actions, online maintenance, better inspections, knowing when to inspect, what happened is the utilities were managing the plant better, caused higher safety and higher capacity factor. It's been demonstrated numbers by doing everything that was done. Next slide, please. So now focusing on EPRI, what do we do? What areas do we cover? Well, basically all aspects of operating a nuclear plant. Everything from materials, fundamental science on primary system corrosion, Many, many years working with steam generator management. Boiling water reactor vessels internals, pressurized water reactor materials, and welding and repair. We have a laboratory in North Carolina where we actually work and develop um, welding techniques for repairing nuclear plants. We're working on underwater laser welding to deploy on BWR internals. We're even working now on different metals for different welding techniques. Significant work going on. on the, most of the welding procedures used in the US were developed in the EPRI um, lab. Fuel reliability program. I mentioned some of the activities there. Reducing fuel failures to almost zero. And later on, I'll come to another key project being done in that area. Use fuel high-level waste management. What to do with fuel once it's been used. Significant work going on there with long-term storage of fuel. Long-term operation. Operating a plant beyond 40 years. We are now working to look at can you operate a nuclear plant beyond 60 years. We've been working on this for about five years. As we stand here today, we see no reason why a nuclear plant provided it's well maintained, cannot run beyond 60 years. And I won't give you the name of the plant, but there is a utility in the US has decided they are going to put an application together for a second time round on license renewal to run a plant to 80 years. Non-destructive examination, tremendous amount of work done non-destructive evaluation. Equipment reliability, maintenance and engineering, instrumentation and control. Risk and safety management, a subject I know you've talked about a lot in this group and we'll probably talk about more today. EPRI has some of the best experts in the world on risk and safety. We develop the procedures, the processes, the guidelines which are used in the US, which the regulator uses with the utilities. We maintain the databases of fire hazards, of flooding hazards. For example, we recently worked on updating the seismic hazards in the US nuclear fleet. So we have a really significant and unique expertise in risk and safety. Advanced nuclear technology, that's work on new plants, deploying the lessons from the last 40 or 50 years into the new plants to make them better. 
and then chemistry, low-level waste, and radiation management. And that is, again, working to improve the plants. An example, we develop the light water reactor chemistry guidelines, which document what you should do, what criteria you should use, what protocols you should follow. We hand those to IMPO. IMPO use those guidelines as the basis of their inspection of the plant chemistry programs to make sure the plants are maintaining the highest technical standards. An example of the way we work together with IMPO. Next slide. Okay, so moving on now to risk and safety management. So this is one of our programs, but I know it's something that this um, working group is very interested in. So uh, the mission of this group is here, construct a risk-informed framework that enables safety benefits which reduce risk, improve safety focus, whilst maintaining the operational flexibility. Back to the example of online maintenance. That provided the operational flexibility and demonstrated the increased safety. And I've touched on a little bit, so what do we do? Develop technical methods. The methods for doing a seismic PRA. The methods for doing a fire PRA. The methods for understanding external events. Gathering data. PRAs can't be done without the data to back up the probabilities, the history, understanding what experience has been. So we maintain many, many databases from around the world. Again, it's not just the US. It's from around the world of what that data is to feed the PRAs. And then you need the tools with which to bring it all together. I think a lot of people in this room have heard of the MAP code, our modular accident analysis program. There are many, many other codes and tools we have developed over the years to help um, develop PRAs and actually understand the safety. And then you have the tools and the methods. You need people. So we now are in the um, business of training to actually help people use the tools to develop the next generation of PRA staff and other people. Next slide, please. This slide really kind of covers what I just sh discussed on the other slide, shows the different areas of the risk and safety program, methods and guidance, around internal events and external events and other hazards. Applications, things like risk-informed regulation, looking at reliability, doing work even in security and emergency planning and the risk issues there, support the software and the tools and the training, and then we also have this area down here, special things we've done since Fukushima. And I'll touch on some of those a bit later on. So we did add a significant amount of scope to this program after Fukushima. Next slide, please. So internal flooding. This is an example of a guideline developed which is used around the world. And from an internal hazard perspective, this is probably the highest um, contributor to core damage frequency from an internal event perspective. So, we, so the team developed a consensus approach on internal flooding, and that's used around the world. We have the data to support the frequencies, and actually this is a really good example of EPRI developing the global standard for how to deal with internal flooding events. Next slide, please. Seismic evaluation, seismic PRA. Seismic is currently a big issue in the US, a big issue in Europe. We're working with the US utilities to develop what their seismic hazards are. We're also working with European utilities to understand how they can work uh, and develop seismic PRAs. Looking at fragility analysis. This is a very complex area, as, as you know. And this is a great example of an area where U.S. and Japanese collaboration could really improve the knowledge of the world in the seismic area. And the bottom item here, guideline for response to an earthquake. This is a report we wrote many, many years ago. 
and it basically do do documents what you should do following an earthquake to inspect the plant and restart the plant. This, is, this was used by TEPCO at Kashiwazaki Karawa to inspect the plant. It was also used by Dominion at North Anna after the small earthquake in, um, in the US, but it was used by North Anna to inspect the plant and justify the restart. This is a great example of us doing the research ahead of the need. And when the need came, we had the report. And there's many examples of us doing that and being able to produce the report. Another example, which is particularly relevant here, is about five years ago, we did research on media to clean up um, contaminated water. I did a report comparing different techniques, different solutions um, to do that. And shortly after the Fukushima event, um, Rosa Yang here was in Japan and was able to produce that, give that report to TEPCO, and that is what led them to what I think you're all aware of, the Curian system. And when we did that research, there was no particular um, need, desperate need for that report but it was tremendously valuable to TEPCO and the whole of Japan having that information available to get the Curian system developed. Another wonderful example of having the research done and available on the shelf. Next slide, please. Fire risk analysis. Another big issue in the US and globally, how to understand fires, the impacts, the impacts on PRA. So again, consensus guidance on fire PRA, looking at enhancements, looking at fire modeling. This is something we've done in close collaboration with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the US. Even down to when the training is given in the US on the fire PRAs, it is given jointly by EPRI and the NRC together to utility staff and NRC staff in the same room the collaboration is so close on making sure those methods are correct. Next slide, please. PRA safety software. I've mentioned MAP, the analysis, um, the severe accident analysis code. Gothic, a containment um, modeling code. Retran and Viper, thermohydraulics and systems codes. And then we have software, human reliability calculator. Then we have other codes for doing PRAs and for understanding plant risk. And then we, e we have codes and tools to support doing all these, um, these analyses and documenting what the results are. Next slide, please. I mentioned training. Training of risk professionals is significant. Utilities can rely on vendors, can rely on contractors to do a lot of the PRA work. One of the secrets of success, though, is utilities having staff who understand what they're being given by those contractors, what they're being given by those um, external consultants. So what EPRI determined five years ago was that there was a shortage of qualified PRA staff in the utilities. So we developed a training course. It's six one-week modules taught by experts in their field. And we have now trained many, many staff of both the regulator and utilities. And I think this is one of the graduating classes after their six weeks training. So it's been a, it's been a significant success. And it's one of those things we're, we're looking to transfer, move forward into Japan with. Next slide, please. And here we are. So we, we have a short course for executives, which summarizes the six-week course. And I think it's about a day long. And we present this in the US, and we're bringing that to Japan in April, working with Jansi. And that is to help the executives in utilities understand PRA, understand the terminology, understand what can be done, what can't be done, and what to be aware of, and what questions to ask. And then, again, working with Jansi, we're looking to bring 
the six-week course to Japan to help start training that capability in the Japanese industry. So this is a, an exciting development, and I think it shows the commitment that EPRI has to the Japanese industry. Next slide, please. So following Fukushima, we did a, we've done a significant amount of work, as of many um, areas. So uh, here's some examples. Next slide. The US industry came together and developed a Fukushima Response Steering Committee, which was NEI, IMPO, and EPRI. You, the names you've heard a lot. I'm very fortunate to be one of the members of that committee and have been since very shortly after the event. EPRI has really provided the technical input to the committee to move forward, to understand what needs to be done, what should be done, and what the opportunities are. Rosa here is working on a has worked on the technical evaluation, understand the technical root cause, and is also working using the map code on a technical reconstruction of what happened in the events and actually developing and improving the map code. And that has a tremendous benefit to the rest of the industry around the world. A great example of collaboration. Information coming to us from Japan, improving the map code for the rest of the members around the world. <clears throat> External events, we're working on seismic, working on flooding. EPRI has recently been asked by the US utilities to be the focal point for understanding the current state of science in all external events. So that, again, is something we will be doing and sharing with all our members. Severe accident management, developing the technical basis documents for the severe accident management guidelines. Good amount of work on spent fuel pools. Collaborating with the NRC in this case, there was discussions about the potential for a fire in a uh, spent fuel pool, a zirconium fire. So we worked with the NRC to understand the chances of that phenomena and the impact and what could be done to address it. And then there's a slide in a moment about radiological release mitigation. This is the, the discussion around filtered vents. Next one, please. So the technical valuation, I mentioned this, that Rose has been working on it. This is using the modular accident analysis program to understand what happened. And this is a screenshot of Fukushima Daiichi um, Unit 1. And the code drives this and shows what we project from the physics modeling what happened at Fukushima based on the information we've got. So going forward, as more access is gained into the plant, more data is given, it validates the model. And this model is used in the licensing of plants around the world. So it's a, it's a tremendous project going forward to understand what happened. It also has value in the decommissioning of the Fukushima units because this is helping as best as we can predict what the actual damage is, how much fuel exited the cause, and actually what is going to be found in the years to come when people go in to, to actually get and see what needs to be cleaned up. Next slide, please. I mentioned severe accident management guidelines. EPRI produced many years ago the technical bases for those severe accident management guidelines. We've updated them to include things like seawater injection, to include seawater injection that spent fuel pools, to actually talk about events on multiple units on a same site. And these technical bases documents have now been taken by the owners groups <clears throat> and deployed on the rest of the uh, deployed to the to the utilities. Next slide, please. This is something I'm very proud of. Fukushima was a very unfortunate and tragic event. In some way, the timeline was as short as it was because of the zirconium in the core. We're all aware of the zirconium oxidation exothermic reaction. I challenged the team about if there had been no zirconium in the core, could there have been a longer timeline? Could it have been possible to have a lower consequent event? 
I think fuel melt may have occurred, but may there, could we have actually got to a situation of having longer time? So we're looking at two things here. One is boiling water reactor channels, replacing the zirconium channels with silicon carbide. That's about 35% of the zirconium in a BWR core. Very good progress being made with help from the US Department of Energy and our own collaborative funding. So very high hopes of that being deployable in the relatively near-term future. The other one, which is looking at fuel clad, which is a lot more difficult and is bigger than any one institute can, can be, we're making some progress developing an international collaboration with um, OECD, um, many of the utilities in Europe, working with uh, other groups around the world, looking at what options are for replacing zirconium as a fuel clad. This is our concept, which is a molybdenum tube with a very thin coating of zirconium on the inside and the outside. And the reason for this, the thin coat of zirconium is it keeps the, what the water sees is the same as it always saw. It sees zirconium. But if there's an accident, it's a very thin film of zirconium which oxidizes straight away with very little heat added. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the concepts, may not be the concept that goes forward, but gives an example of some of the international collaboration we can pull together to try and improve our industry. Next slide, please. This is an example of what we've done in the US around safety of BWRs. Many, many countries decided post Fukushima and some before Fukushima to require the installation of filtered vents. And that is a good thing in, for many, um, many countries. What happened in the US we ask the question, is that the best solution? Are there alternative strategies? And the analysis we did showed that the most important thing is actually to cool the core and cool the debris if it exits the vessel. Because if you don't cool that debris, it will eventually cause a containment bypass. And then the analysis we did using our map code and other codes was to say, what is the benefit of having that water in containment? And we demonstrated that the water covering the core debris in itself acts as a filter and actually provides a filter effectiveness equal or even better in some cases to a filtered vent. So that is a very good academic position, which was taken forward by NEI to the NRC. The NRC staff and commission accepted this as one acceptable solution to achieving a filtering of radioactive release. It doesn't mean that no utilities will fit filtered vents. What it means is there's an alternative if plant by plant they can demonstrate that, the, the war, that th this is a more appropriate technique for their plant. Tremendous use of historical research, our codes, and the expertise of our team. Next slide, please. So I'm now getting to the industry structure and interactions. Next slide. So many, many interfaces around the globe. You see NEI up there, you see IMPO, you see the USNRC, um, WANO. Down here, research entities, CEA in France, Materials Aging Institute, JANSI. We have a, a strong collaboration with IAEA, KHNP, many research entities. This is just a small subset of the network of interactions around the world. And this, again, I can't overemphasize the strength of EPRI is that global collaboration. Next slide, please. So within the US, NEI, EPRI, and IMPO, I'm sure many of the discussions here have been, how does this work? How does it fit together? How do these three organizations work together? What I can tell you is it's not easy. 
I'm sure Mr. Spinato is going to talk about it as well. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of communicating, making sure each of us stays in our role and having a clear understanding of what that role is. I use this diagram of a, of a stool with three legs. Each of us is one of those legs and the stool does not work if one of us doesn't do what we should be doing. So we rely on each other to be successful. IMPO focused on operational excellence at the plants. Using information, as I mentioned, chemistry guidelines, steam generator guidelines, materials guidelines, which we produce, IMPO then uses those to understand what the right operational approaches should be to maintain the plants at high level of capacity and safety. Again, NEI works with the regulator, is the single voice of the nuclear industry in the US to the regulator, informed by the technology and methods and processes developed by EPRI. I mentioned about the utility um, planning to submit a second license renewal application. So that is based on information which EPRI is developing. But NEI have worked with the regulator to help explain that so that the regulator is ready to accept the application when it is made. So NEI, single voice of the industry to the regulator using information from EPRI. IMPO, focused on operational excellence, again, supported by EPRI. And our work and our scope is informed by what IMPO see, their databases, the results of their plant evaluations, it gives us tremendous insight into what the issues on the fleet are and actually guides our research. And again, NEI, they work with the regulator. We figure out what's on the regulator's mind and informs our research scope as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> NRC has a regulatory arm and a research arm. We have memorandums of understanding with NRC research. And this is something which is important to me. There is so much work that needs to be done in the area of nuclear power that we've agreed with the NRC that there is no benefit to society if the same research is done twice. So the MOUs are basically, we tell NRC research what our research plans are. They tell us what theirs are. And we agree in many cases to share the research results. And the agreement is we each draw our own conclusions, but we don't spend money doing the same research. And that actually makes the whole industry stronger by just doing the work in the right place, doing it once. And you see the dotted line here. My team, very often invited by the regulatory side of the NRC to come and inform the commission and the NRC staff on the details of technical issues. So it's a very healthy relationship with the NRC, very healthy relationship with NEI and IMPO. Next slide, please. We have a strong relationship with DOE. The Idaho National Lab is um, the lead national lab in the US for nuclear power. EPRI is actually part of the management consortium that runs Idaho National Lab. And Rosa here is actually on the board of Idaho National Lab. So we have that close of a relationship with the national labs. And actually, we inform the national labs what the priorities of the nuclear industry are, and actually monitor that and use those results and we get funding from the DOE. We also have collaborative projects where we bring money to the table, they bring money to the table, and we actually share the results. And we have the relationship with the Idaho National Lab, but that gives us an insight into all these other labs as well and what their scope and research is. For example, at Oak Ridge National Lab has one of the biggest supercomputers in the world. We are part of a project called CASEL, the Consortium for Advanced Simulation of Light Water Reactors, using all the computing power within the Department of Energy 
to do a, a very detailed computer simulation of light water reactors with the view to the future that that will help improve the safety of light water reactors going forward. Next slide, please. So here's the summary. So our R&D contributes to plant safe reliability performance and the safety R&D gives that guidance, the tools and the training. I hope you can now see the unique model we have and the, the global collaboration. We truly are more than a US organization. We we've got this collaboration from around the globe, which we're very proud of. Significant um, number of staff with world-class expertise. We add, we add value to projects by getting the right people and the right research connected and making sure we deliver it to utilities in a usable way. We have four full members in Japan. All utilities are participating, and we've been um, working with the Japanese industry for many, many years. And I can't um, say, you know, I can't understate how important it is to EPRI to support the Japanese industry at this critical time. So thank you for your time, and hopefully I stayed within the 40 minutes. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Wilmshurst.